of Lord Nishingadev. Prahlad accepted that his worshipable Lord can appear in any kind of form. So in other words, what's the big deal? Half man, half lion, fish, horse, swan, <laughs> cowherd boy, what's the big deal? <laughs> so Prahlad was not phased, so to speak. Whereas everyone else was just totally baffled and stunned. What kind of form is this? So Prahlad stepped forward and fell at the feet of Lord Nishingadev, who then put his paw on top of Prahlad's head. And in this way, the full Krishna consciousness of Prahlad manifested. It was already there. One point made by the Acharyas is that if Prahlad was still under the influence of his demoniac family line, if his body was still contaminated by Asarika Bhava, the consciousness of a demon, Lord Nishingadeva would have never put his paw on his head, on Prahlad's head with affection. So it's not that suddenly by Lord Nishingade putting his paw on Prahlad's head, Prahlad burst forth with bhakti. No, it was already there, but by the touch of Nishingadev's paw on his head, Prahlad was able to manifest what was already there. Interesting point. And the first thing Prahlad said to Lord Nishingadev was that, who am I? born in such a low demoniac family. Yet, I understand you are interested only in bhakti. No material uh, practices will capture you in the core of the heart. Severe austerities, taking this ashram, that ashram, doing this yagya, that yagya, none of that attracts your presence. Only bhakti will do it. So in this way, Prahlad explains his own presence. Look at my material circumstances, the son of the biggest demon ever. Obviously, it's only by bhakti <laughs> that I, I can receive such favor. Look at me. <laughs> consider my position, consider my circumstances. So now, as we go further into the prayers by Prahlad Maharaj, <clears throat> we'll get some insights into Prahlad and Lord Nishingadev. First, we're going to discuss fear, because Prahlad, on the one hand, will say, I'm not afraid, and then on the other hand, he'll present some things that he's afraid of. Some of you may know the famous verse, Naivo Tujay Paradaratjaya Vaitaranyas Tadvirya Gaya Mahamrita Magna Chittam Shoche Tato Vamukache Tasa Indriyarta Maya Sukhaya Bharam Udvato Vimuda. My dear Lord Nishringadeva, I'm not afraid of material existence. I'm simply lamenting for all the conditioned souls who are suffering. As for myself, I'm always in the Mahamrita, the great nectarian ocean of hearing and chanting your glories. I've got no worries about myself in this material world. But I'm so caring for the conditioned souls who are struggling under an unnecessary burden. Maya Sukaya Bharam. I always point out, you know what it's like to suffer under a real burden? <laughs> Carrying a heavy suitcase for some distance longer than you thought? I've had to do that sometimes. <laughs> Carrying something on your shoulder? <laughs> But Prahlad says, Maya Sukhaya Bharam, struggling under a false burden. Now, just think about that. A burden that's not necessary. A burden that actually doesn't exist. Maya Sukha. Illusory happiness. So Prahlad says, I'm not 
afraid of material existence. I'm always drowning in the Mahamrita, the great ocean of hearing and chanting Krishna's glories. But now in this verse that we're going to chant today, he talks about fear. <clears throat> Om no, we did Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. All right. We'll chant. Naham babem yajitate te bayana kasya. Jivaka nature brukuti rubber sogra dumstrat. Antrasraja shataja keshara shanku kainan. Nirada bita digi bar adi bin nakagrat. Nirada bita digi bar adi bin nakagrat. Naham babem yajita te te bayana kasya. Naham babem yajita te te bayana kasya. brukuti rabba sogra dhamstrat. Antra Shraja Shataja Keshara Sanku Karna Antra Shraja Shataja Keshara Sanku Karna I will just have one Prabhu and one Mataji chant so because I think we have to finish at eight thirty, is that so or okay. One Prabhu, please. Naham bibi mejitati di bhayana kasya. Naham bibi mejitati di bhayana kasya. Jivarka netra bhukuti rabhasogra damshka. Jivarka netra bhukuti rabhasogra damshka. Antrasra jakshata jakeshara shanku karna. Antrasra jakshata jakeshara shanku karna. Abhaishtavi Na, not, aham, I, bebe me, am afraid, ajita, O supreme victorious person, who are never conquered by anyone. Te, your. Ati, very much. Bayanaka, fearful. Asya, mouth. Jiva, tongue. Arkanetra, eyes shining like the sun. Brukuti, frowning eyebrows. Rabbasa, strong. Ugradamstrat, ferocious teeth. Antrasaja, garland by intestines. Shataja, bloody. Kesara, manes. Shankukarnat, wedge like ears. Nirhada, by a roaring sound, caused by you, Bita, frightened, Dikibat, from which even the great elephants, Adibit, piercing the enemy, Nakagat, the tips of whose nails. Translation.
<laughs> my Lord, who are never conquered by anyone, I am certainly not afraid of your ferocious mouth and tongue, your eyes bright like the sun, or your frowning eyebrows. I do not fear your sharp, pinching teeth, your garland of intestines, your mane soaked with blood, or your high, wedge-like ears. Nor do I fear your tumultuous roaring, which makes elephants flee to distant places, or your nails, which are meant to kill your enemies. Purport. Lord Nishingade's fierce appearance was certainly most dangerous for the non-devotees. But for Prahlad Maharaj, such a fearful appearance was not at all disturbing. The lion is very fearsome for other animals, but its cubs are not at all, not at all afraid of the lion. The water of the sea is certainly dreadful for all living entities on the land. But within the sea, even the small fish is unafraid. Why? Because the small fish has taken shelter of the big ocean. It is said that although great elephants are taken away by the flooding waters of the river, the small fish swim opposite the current. Therefore, although the Lord sometimes assumes a fierce appearance to kill the Duskrites, the devotees worship him. Keshava Dita Narahari Rupa Jai Jagadisha Hare. The devotees always take pleasure in worshiping the Lord and glorifying the Lord in any form, either pleasing or fierce. Om Agana Timurandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshun Militang Yena Tazmai Shri Gurave Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sri Adwaita Gradha Sivasadi Go Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so this verse gives you a stunning portrait photo of Lord Nisringhade. And you can meditate on the description, all the various aspects. First of all, he's a jit, unconquerable by anyone. The Lord is also known as a chuta, infallible. No matter what the Supreme Personality of Godhead does, no matter what form he takes, he's infallible and unconquerable. And the more intimate meaning of a chuta related to being unconquerable is that the Lord never fails in his enjoyment. Even he takes the form of a half man, half lion. Even if he takes the form of a boar, he is infallible in his pleasure seeking and we know what our position is <laughs> when it comes to seeking material happiness we are chuta <laughs> our efforts are quite problematic mm. so we'll be talking about this more at our festival of inspiration saturday night for the wider audience will be explaining how the Supreme Personality of God is justified for being called Bhagavan because his enjoyment endeavors are infallible. So now you're getting, as we said, the photo, portrait photo of Lord Nishingade. Ferocious mouth and tongue, eyes bright like the sun, frowning eyebrows, sharp pinching teeth, garland of intestines, mane, the hairs, soaked with blood, high wedge-like ears, tumultuous roaring which makes elephants flee far away, and nails which are meant to kill your enemies. This is for your meditation. <laughs> mm. One misunderstanding devotees have sometimes is that Lord Nishringadev have appeared specifically for Prahlad. Yes and no. As Srila Prabhupada explains, Lord Nishringadev appeared 
for Pallad, yes, but for the benefit, but also for the benefit of all living entities. Lord Nishinganev is showing the bond between the pure bhakta and himself. And what and by taking the form of a half man, half lion, not only is the Lord negating the benedictions or getting around the benedictions given by Brahma to Harandigashipu, but the Lord is also demonstrating he can take whatever form he likes and reciprocate with his devotee. So Pallad's saying, I don't fear all this what I'm seeing. Whereas you heard about the reaction of the greatest devatas, like Brahma, Shiva. Even Lakshmi Devi was baffled, although she sees Lord Yashingadeva all the time in Vaikuntha. We explained by the arrangement of the Lila Shakti, the pastime potency, she reacted like, I've never seen this before. <laughs> Showing you that spiritual life is ever fresh. So, Prahlad is saying, I'm not afraid of Lord Nishringadev. I know this is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I understand why he's appeared in this way. But I have something else I fear. I'm born in a demoniac family. I fear their association. Mm. And he's going to describe that fear more in the next verse. So bear in mind our theme, fear and no fear. What is Pallad afraid of and what is Pallad not afraid of? He was not afraid of his father, Hiranyakashipu. In fact, in relaying the the history of Pallad's torture at the hands of Hiranyakashipu, Srila Prabhupada explained that Pallad had a different take on the whole torturous affairs. Pallad thought, my father is playing with me. <clears throat> my father is showing affection. Hmm. <laughs> so either you would say Pallad, today they would say Pallad needs therapy. <laughs> But this is the vision of the Mahabhagavat. Such a devotee sees everything perfectly in relation to Krishna, sees Krishna in everything. So in spite of Hiranyakashipu's horrendous, torturous efforts, Prahlad had a different take. But he says, I'm afraid due to my family influences. I don't fear Lord Nishingade. Everyone else did. <clears throat> but Prahlad says, no, not me. But I'm afraid of the Asura Sangha, the association and influences derived from <clears throat> my demoniac family. <clears throat> and he's going to explain that more in the next verse. So keep that in mind again. Fear, yet no fear. <clears throat> so text 16. Trustosmyaham kripana vatsala dusa hogra samsara chakra karanagra satam pranita badasva karma behu shattama te nigrimulam prito pravarga sharanam yayase kadanu. O most powerful, insurmountable Lord who are kind to the fallen souls. I have been put into the association of demons as a result of my activities, and therefore I'm very much afraid of my condition of life within this material world. When will that moment come when you will call me to the shelter of your lotus feet, which are the ultimate goal for liberation from conditional life? <clears throat> so, the question that should arise in your mind is, Prahlad is afraid of material existence? Not exactly. You need to go deeper into the situation. <clears throat> he says, I've been put into the association of demons as a result of my activities, and therefore I'm very much afraid of my condition of life within this material world. But then 
in the verses coming up ahead, the famous verse we just recited, I'm not afraid of material existence. I'm always drowning in the Mahamrita, the ocean of hearing and chanting. So are you thinking, Prahlad, make up your mind. <laughs> are, you, are you afraid or are you not afraid? So the question is, what is Prahlad actually afraid of? You have to drill down. Hmm. So he is not afraid of the material world. He is afraid of materialistic association. So you have to kind of drill deeper and pull out that uh, element that Pradad is really addressing in terms of his fear. He's not afraid of the cycle of repeated birth and death, samsara chakra. Not afraid of that. <clears throat> He's, his consciousness is somewhere else. Later in this chapter, he'll explain about the Krishna graha. He says, you want to talk about astrological influences from Saturn or Venus or Mars? Well, they're called grahas. Some of you know that? He, yes. He said, well, I'm under the influence of the Krishna graha, <laughs> the Krishna loka planet. <laughs> so, Prahlad is not reacting by fear of material existence per se. He's afraid of materialistic association within material existence. So there's a, you might say a subtle difference, but no, it's a very major difference. Mm. He's afraid of demoniac association because it's full of aversion to Krishna. You know in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Itcha dvesha samutena dvandva mohena bharata. All living entities are born into this world with mm, aversion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and attachment for imitating the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Prahlad says, I, I'm afraid of those kind of persons. Not material, not the material world, but those kind of persons are in the material world creating problems. <laughs> I'm afraid of them and their attitude of aversion. Think about the word aversion. Mm. What's a more emotionally impactful way of explaining aversion? Just, ah, I don't want you. I don't want this. That's, <laughs> that's aversion. <laughs> so Prahlad is saying that the material existence is full of those kind of characters. And I'm afraid of them. I don't want to be infected. What more? The samsara chakra, the turning wheel of repeated birth and death. Prahlad's not afraid of that per se, but he's afraid of what goes on, the internal dynamics that happen on that wheel, the samsara chakra. He says there's lots of criticism and hatred for the supreme personality of Godhead. So I am afraid of that. So it's very important for us to meditate on the Prahlad's fears, what he's afraid of and what he's not afraid of. We may recall the instruction of Lord Chaitanya when asked, what's the first symptom of a Vaishnav? Sometimes he would say, the one who chants Hare Krishna even once. But another time he said, asat sango chag a Vaishnava char. The symptom of a real Vaishnava, Bhakti Yogi, is that he or she does not take on association with abhaktas, non-devotees. Now you may say, ooh, sounds a little culty, sounds a little fanatical, sectarian. But if you truly understand that someone has COVID, for example, do you always hang around the person? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to get sick. <laughs> Not only do you put on a mask, but you stay away. Uh, some nations uh, still have the health code that if you've got COVID, you've got to go in isolation for five or seven days. Is that still on the books here? Or I don't know what follows it. It's on the books in New Zealand. <laughs> If you got, if you tested positive, you, you go into seclusion for five or seven days. So, 
Everyone agrees, that's practical. But to not have intimate dealings with a bhaktas sounds a bit restrictive, doesn't it? You would think that <coughs> as a devotee, as a bhakti yogi, your heart would just be open to everyone and everything. Everything is beautiful, everything is spiritual in its own way. <laughs> I always mention this program I did in Sydney once in the CBD. It was a bunch of uh, <coughs> Sydney siders there in, in their late 20s, early 30s. All of them were doing quite well in the corporate world. And so after I spoke, I sat down at a, at a table with some of these guys and they were presenting themselves how liberal and open they are. So, okay, Swami, you're into Krishna. He's into scuba diving. <laughs> this one likes skiing. <laughs> this one's really into art. So it's, like, it's all, you know, <laughs> it's all happening. You know? <laughs> Whatever helps you get through the night, you know. <laughs> We're all for that. Krishna, scuba diving, skiing. <laughs> We're open. We're non-sectarian. We're not fanatical. <laughs> Sri Kanta Sena, you remember that kind of consciousness? <laughs> so, how to associate with others in the non-devotee world is always an issue. Of course, sometimes how to associate with devotees in the devotee world is an issue. <laughs> Let's, let's be fair here. <laughs> but uh, ideally, when you're around devotees, there should be no material contaminations wafting through the air. Mm. And Lord Chaitanya is pointing out that <clears throat> if you take on the influences of the non-devotee world, you're going to pay a price in terms of your Krishna consciousness. So often devotees ask, what does it mean when you to <coughs> you're in the world but you don't take on influences? That means you don't put your heart into exchanges with non-devotees. You protect your bhakti heart. You're cordial, you're respectful, but you don't become heart invested. <clears throat> that is a very important principle. Rupa Goswami in Nectar of Instruction also points out Jana Sangha, association with worldly minded persons. That means persons who don't understand bhakti and uh, their conversation is always full of temporary material affairs, attempts to enjoy, making money. So we have to face the facts. Certain conversations are polluting. It doesn't mean you're a fanatic, a bhakti fanatic, or sectarian to acknowledge that. You have to go about it with a cool head. Go about mm, keeping yourself healthy. For a Western audience, I often quote a statement in the New Testament attributed to Jesus, uh, which is actually a deep bhakti principle of application. He said, you, according to the Bible, he said, you have to be in the world but not of the world. So I explained to an audience that that statement is actually high mysticism. It's like saying you've got to be in the ocean, but you can't get wet. <laughs> so our whole bhakti practice, when taken seriously, is meant to produce a, an antiseptic life for you. And you have to be careful. Just like when there's COVID, you're careful. Am I in a public place? Should I wear a mask or not? Or should I do this or that or the other? You know, COVID consciousness. <laughs> you take precautions. And whatever the next pandemic will be, you'll take precautions for that. 
So that, this is what Lord Chaitanya is advising. He's saying the first way you recognize a Vaishnava, a Bhakti Yogi, is that he or she is careful about Sangha, about association, careful about the influences that you take on. So how is that fanatical? How is that sectarian? You want to keep your spiritual health. It doesn't mean you're nasty and mean. Get away! You're an abukta. <laughs> but, you know, persons like to download. And so you have to be careful about exchanging downloading in which your heart's invested. So Prahlad is giving you the graphic presentation. I'm a... I'm not afraid of Lord Nishigade, but there are some things I'm afraid of. And it's not the material world. It's not samsara chakra. It's those persons who inhabit the material world, those persons of an anti-Krishna nature. So in this purport, <laughs> Prabhupada explains that, first of all, Prahlad is admitting that I'm in this material world because of what I've done. Sometimes persons get angry. If there's a God, why did he put me in this situation? Why did he put me in such a suffering world? But Pallad is clearly saying, <clears throat> Swakarma B, the, the course, the reactions, the the unfolding of the reactions of my own activities. That's why I'm here. This is very important for us to take responsibility for our appearance in the material world. Nevertheless, we read in the purport, the Lord is extremely anxious to deliver the conditioned souls. Have you ever been anxious to do something? So, so just Consider, the Supreme Personality of God, it has emotions. Otherwise, how can you have emotions? But anxious to deliver the conditioned souls. In fact, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, you'll read about how the Supreme Personality of God it is in anxiety, particularly as in his, in his eternal form as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's in anxiety about the plight of the conditioned souls and so a real devotee tries to relieve that anxiety of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, particularly of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So I hope that this point about fear and not fear, of being afraid and not being afraid is more clear. It, by meditating on what Prahlad is afraid of and what he's not afraid of, we can get clarity for our own spiritual life. And then there's the point of our taking responsibility for our presence in the material world. The Acharyas point out, Prahlad could blame the Supreme Personality of God, or the Supreme Personality of God could say to Prahlad, did I throw you here into this world? And Prahlad is saying, no, it's my fault. <laughs> you fulfilled my desire, but I am the problem. I'm bound by my karmas. And I'm waiting for when you'll call me to massage your lotus feet. Attachment to your lotus feet will be my passageway out of the world of samsara. So we have time to go for another. I'll just read the translation. O Great One, O Supreme Lord, because of combination with pleasing and displeasing circumstances and because of separation from them, one is placed in a most regrettable position within heavenly or hellish planets as if burning in a fire of lamentation. Although there are many remedies by which to get out of miserable life, any such remedies in the material world are more miserable than the miseries themselves. Therefore, I think that the only remedy is to engage in your service, 
kindly instruct me in such service. This verse also takes some thought because we think, what's wrong with remedies? What's wrong with material solutions? Yeah, it's all material, but still you got to do something. Are we just meant to just be passive and let things happen to us and not respond, not try for a remedy, not try for a solution? So in the purport, Prabhupada says, in a routine way, you must adopt various remedies and solutions. It's just, you take it as just part of coping with life in this world, but you don't put your, all your hope in to these remedies and solutions like, now I'm safe, now all my problems are solved. You do the necessary in kind of an external way. This is sometimes a little difficult to understand. Mm. But you have, when you think about things deeply and study them, you see the so-called remedies always cause problems. And sooner or later, the remedies turn out to cause more miseries than the miseries they were meant to solve. But you have to have a shrewd kind of eye to see that because the glare of Maya is so strong. Just do this and all your problems will be solved. Just take this remedy and happy days are here again. <laughs> so Prabhupada gives a simple way of looking at it. And you can expand upon it with your own thoughts. He said, just like a poor person can become rich, but to become rich, the poor person has to work so hard. So the poor person is thinking, I'm going to remedy my poverty by becoming rich. But the ticket for becoming rich, relatively speaking, is hard work. But the poor person doesn't think about the hard work involved. The poor person thinks about the goal. And behavioral economists in the secular world will be quick to point out to you that anticipation is such a major part of human life, especially in relation to economic development. You visualize what you're going to get, and therefore you overlook the day-by-day -day struggle because you have this vision in your mind's eye. Ah. <laughs> Just like I remember my, I was talking with Pratapana Prabhu, my... My father always wanted a Mercedes. He wanted to live in a flash part of New York City. It was always in his mind's eye. And so that consumed his life. He, he did get it. But at what price? So anticipation, the anticipation that behavioral economists talk about is that what you're seeing up ahead becomes more real and more dominant for you than the endeavor that you're making to get it. The endeavor becomes justified. I'm, I'm not worried about working hard. I see what's coming. Ah. And your mind just goes wild because basically material existence is live in the mind. So whatever material goal is there, you have to undergo some tapasya. Furthermore, not only do you undergo some austerity, some tapasya to get the goal, you also undergo austerity to hold on to what you've got. <laughs> I like the example one acharya from South India, I forget his name, gives, that he talks about fame. Everyone would like to be famous, well-respected, well known. So he said fame, the acquisition of fame is like acquiring a heavy jeweled umbrella in the hot sun. So yes, you open the, the you put the heavy bejeweled umbrella, maybe gold handle, golden handle encrusted with diamonds. You, you hold it over your head and ah, there's relief from the sun. But walk a few steps, walk a few steps more, and you realize this is a heavy umbrella. But it's giving me relief from the sun. <laughs> so that's the problem with fame. You can get it, and it seems to give relief, 
but then to maintain it is hard labor. To main, you might say, well, we're, Swami, we're not interested so much in fame. We just like a little respect around here. <laughs> respect when I walk into the mandir. <laughs> But even just to get that, it takes some maintenance. It takes some effort. It's not just like fame and respect mm, uh, that you strive for and get. It just it, it doesn't stay there without effort. Just like when you're trying to market something online. You've got to work at it. You can't just say, okay, we made an online presence last year. That's it. <laughs> You've got to stroke the situation. You've got to keep uh, working on it. So this is why Prahlad is saying in terms of material mm, remedies, they're actually more miserable than the miseries they're meant to solve. What example can I give? Electric batteries are supposed to save the day from climate disruption, right? What is it? They have a law in Australia now, by, or other countries in Europe, they have a law. And by 1935, no more petrol burning vehicles can be sold. Uh, it's like that here, too? Or? Getting there, okay. It's, it's going to save the day from all the problems caused by the toxic consciousness of human beings who are destroying their own habitat. Electric vehicles will do it all. But, the electric vehicles require for their batteries something coming out of cobalt. And cobalt is only available a little bit in Australia, a little bit in Russia, but the lion's share, the huge portion of cobalt comes from a small section of a country in Africa, the Congo. And there you see films and photos of hundreds of thousands of persons in the most abject, miserable circumstances, scraping the ground for cobalt. Children, women, oh, living in such hellish lives, going underground into mines, and there are no safety rules, and the mines are collapsing on top of them. That's where the major portion of cobalt for electric batteries in your laptop, in your smartphone, in your vehicles, that's where it comes from. And so now there's a big expose. Red cobalt. Cobalt is red. Look what it's doing. You don't know when you drive your electric vehicle. You think, ah, we're, we're helping. We're saving the environment. But meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of persons are working in the most hellish conditions to supply cobalt for the world. So whenever, whenever you trace something back to its source, you always find a problem. That's what Prahlad Maharaj is talking about. There's no, you can't get away free. You can't get away problem free. This is a world of action and reaction. So as he says, mm, oh great one, Bhuman, oh Supreme Lord, because of, and I'll think about this, because of combination with pleasing and displeasing circumstances. That's a very appropriate description of material life. It's a bundle of pleasing and displeasing circumstances combining together. Sometimes these pleasing and displeasing circumstances are upon you. Sometimes they're apart from you. But the sum total, the, the, the Mm, what eventuates from all this swirling, pleasing, and non-pleasing circumstances is that you are <clears throat> placed in a most regrettable position, even if you're in the heavenly planets. Now, that's a tough one to understand because especially in the Western world, those who are a bit religious talk about going to heaven. But here, Bhagavatam is condemning even the heavenly planets. What to speak of the hellish planets? Bhagavatam is totally transcendental. It's out of this world. Sometimes we might think it's too much out of this world. <laughs> so we need to listen to these prayers by Prahlad Maharaj because Prahlad 
is going to make you unattracted to material happiness. What do you think about that? <laughs> is that on your goals list? Is that on your task list? To become unattracted to material happiness? No, we want material happiness and Krishna too. <laughs> but if you leave it to Prahlad, he will deprogram you. <laughs> so let's consider that very seriously. And at the end of this purport, Prabhupada really nails, nails us. The entire world is under the illusion that people will be happy by advancing in materialistic measures to counteract the miseries of conditional life, but this attempt will never be successful. Humanity must be trained to engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. That is the purpose of the Krishna conscious movement. There can be no happiness in changing one's material conditions, for everywhere there is trouble and misery. Nah. <laughs> it's too much, isn't it? <laughs> Why does he have to be so spot on? <laughs> Why can't he be a bit more vague and warm and fuzzy? <laughs> But these purports are Prabhupada's mercy upon us. He said his purports are his devotional ecstasies. He said anyone can translate. But as far as the purports, the bhakti the purports, that's where he pours out his pure bhakti heart. So, this behavior of thinking, I can solve at least some of the problems of material life by advancing materialistic measures. This is what Prahlad is condemning. You can't do it. It looks like you can do it. It's a mirage. Well, you're, you don't have enough money, you don't have this, you don't have that, you don't have a good partner. Well, just alter the circumstances and you'll be happy. Wow. <laughs> This, this consciousness of, it's called material adjustment, is very alluring. Now that doesn't mean we can't take steps as devotees to remedy a material problem. You break an arm and then you say, well, no material measures will counteract my broken arm. <laughs> this is fanaticism. That's not what the Bhagavatam is saying. Yes, get your broken arm fixed, but don't think your real problem in life has been solved. Your real problem is that you're on the samsara chakra and being influenced by those who are of impure consciousness. So bhakti takes a cool head. Because often as soon as you say something like that, material counteraction is, will always be a failure. People just say, well, wait a minute now. What do you expect us to do? Does that mean when you're sick, you never go to a doctor? Is that the way your cult functions? <laughs> <laughs> you're one of those, huh? <laughs> no, it means that, yes, we go to the doctor. We try to find the best doctor, especially because we want to take care of our machine, our bodily machine, for Krishna's service. But we don't think the doctor has solved our real problems in life. That's the difference. So I hope everyone's got that, yes? yes. Okay. All right. Maybe we have time for one question or so, if we're really going to start at 8.30. Yes. Yes, thank you for reminding me. I was going to say that point. He's actually asking for the method. Please tell me the method. He's asking about real yoga. Prahlad is teaching yoga. But because our heads are so full of the contemporary meaning of yoga, we miss the point. Please tell me the method, the yoga of being your servant. Teach me bhakti yoga. Anything else? Where can we learn bhakti yoga? 
Well, hopefully it's going on now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Shringa Bhagavan Ki! Prahlad Maharaj Ki! Go Premadandi!